Welcome to the interlude with Drew. What's up, everybody? This is Andrew McCain. Welcome to another episode of the interlude with Drew. I have a very special guest with me today. This is Alan Snoop Evans, one of the coldest bass players oh. out here currently, <laughs> and one of the best man. of all time. Man, I appreciate you taking man. this time today to do this interview, bro. How's it going with you, man? Man, it's my pleasure, man. Honored to be uh, considered, man. Everything is good, man. Had a <clears throat> long day of recording and uh, just finally just getting home. Yes, sir. But uh, yeah, man, I appreciate you hitting me up, man. Absolutely, bro. So how was yes, 2020 sir. for you personally and professionally? Because we know it's crazy for everybody, but how was it for you personally? It was, it was scary. It was scary at first. I, uh, you know, with everything uh, going on with church, uh, you know, just, you know, churches being shut down and, <clears throat> you know, uh, so, you know, this is, I, I play bass for a living. Like, this is what I do. I don't, you know, I, I do this full time. And uh, it was, it was scary at first. I was prepared to, you know, get a job at Kroger. You know, I was, I was looking at Kroger. I had, um, <clears throat> I had, uh, did a, um, filled out for uh uber eats you know i was doing that just ways to make money and and man just out of nowhere like calls just like kept coming back to back so it was it was so it was so seamless to the point like i actually i actually thought somebody was playing a prank on me like it was it was happening it was happening that much back to back it, it was a, a pre-recording um lessons uh somebody needed me on a track somebody wanted me to just um to make a video just it was just one thing after another from from the start of the pandemic until now just i've been i've been working i've been working just as much or more as before the whole thing started so it's it's been it's been you know i mean with, with everything all the death that's going on and like that's that's been that's been, you know, hard to deal with, you know, have some death in the family and just, you know, people that I know, people in the, uh, I'm Kojic, so Kojic got hit real hard, you know, oh, yeah. everybody got hit hard, but yeah, yeah it's, it was just, everything's just, everything is like, I've never seen nothing like this before in my life, I'm pretty sure everybody can say that, but, but, um, but God is still good, God is still yes, been blessing, we never, we never missed we never missed a uh, meal, never missed a payment. God is, God is absolutely amazing. Man, that, I'm glad to hear that God has been taking care of you yes, guys. Sir. So it, it, it's funny because you actually played on the song, It Keeps Happening. And just the way how you described, um, you know, all yeah. the blessings coming in, the the song back here is shared. So that, that, that's yeah. like prophetic, really. Man, it, it really makes no sense. Just that's, that's God. That's how he worked. Yeah, man. Yes, sir. So let's let's take it back to the beginning. So how did you get your start in music initially? Uh started um started out playing drums, you know, just like every church kid, you know, started out playing drums. That's the most fun thing to play. Oh yeah. You know, sure. you get to just make noise and, and just move, you know, just full of energy. So I just want to move. I just want to, you know, so I was on there and just played drums, had a love for drums and uh, got older around, uh, I don't know, I guess around 11, 12, started messing with the, you know, bass. Wasn't real serious about it. Just I saw it, you know, I heard it and, uh, you know, just messing around with it. I, well, I say I was intrigued with it around 12, 13. I think uh, my dad got me my first bass around 14. Okay. And just, you know, messing around with it, not really taking it serious, you know, dropping the bass, you know, the tuning pegs coming all off of it and stuff, you know, <laughs> just everything, just, you know, <clears throat> it wasn't until, it wasn't until 15, man, I can't even, uh, I can't even explain. It's just, I just, I feel head over heels in love with it, man, at 15. So to the point that, like I stopped playing video games. I stopped oh, wow. playing. Like I wasn't interested in basketball. None of that. All I wanted to do, I would lock myself in my room and just practice all night, all day, and just you know, yeah, it just it just took over. Like you know, 
Wow. Yes, sir. That's incredible. So, okay. So once you started to get into it, um, who were your main influences? Like, who did you look up to that was playing the bass? Um, in the church, and this, this is, I mean, this is in, uh, you know, these bass players are world renowned, but like just there's, you know, there's your secular influences, but mm -hmm. like me coming up in church, there's guys that really were a staple in, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, just me learning and growing, um, one guy, he is it's, it's like some hometown heroes, I guess, a guy named Vincent Fitzgerald from here, and a guy named Ivan Wood, Woodard that used to go to uh, we used my um, my first church, uh, my uh, actually my first uh, first lady just passed uh, last week, and she was like oh, wow. eighty four, and you know, it was Macron Temple, and just that's where I that's where I like played drums, and you know, and I was I was a little kid playing drums. And, there's a guy named Ivan Woodard there that played bass. I just, I, I would notice him and, you know, he was like Nate McCutcheon and these are all, you know, guys from, from home. And you got, then I started to get hip to people like uh, Volley Craig. He's one of my greatest influences. Volley Craig, um, you, you've heard him on um, Dorinda, Dorinda uh, Clark Cole's first album. Okay. Um, coming out. That's, that's him playing that. He, he's been, uh, he's been, working doing like secular, he played for Pub Daddy, you know, he's from Detroit and you got people like Terrence Palmer, DeAndre Thomas, is, you know, it's so many, uh, so many. And I know I'm missing somebody. I, I hate, I hate when I start naming names. Yeah, yeah. Then you got, uh, <clears throat> you no, know, you got, when I, when I first, like when I first heard Joe Smith, like oh, that man. just, Joe Smith is man, that, that man was a, that man was a wizard, you know? Mm -hmm. And he just, like, he just made me, he just intrigued me. So, you know, you got Joe Smith, you got Goose you got, oh, man, you got, it's it's so many amazing bass players. Uh, you know, Reggie Parker, and just so many, you know, in New York, L.A., just all over the place. And then, you know, uh, the secular, you know, people like Marcus Miller, you know, yeah. Marcus Miller, just, man, like, I, it's funny because I used to I used to want to be a magician when I was younger. Oh wow! I wanted to be a magician. Yeah, yeah. Like I yeah. tried to do that stuff, and like I remember watching David Copperfield, and like I remember just being amazed at what he could do. Just like I just be like, wow! Like how did you do that? I felt I felt that same amazement when I first heard Marcus Miller. I felt that same just oh my god, what just happened? Like. I felt that same thing when I first heard Marcus. And then when I heard Victor, oh my God, it just, yeah, yeah. you know, when I saw the possibilities, and yeah, then this, then Jocko, then John Petitucci, and this Hadrian Farrar, it's, it's, it's so many, it's too many to name, you know, Anthony Jackson, uh, Thaddeus Trivia, this, I can go on, like, oh, I can literally go on. So many. Yes, sir. So like, so listen to them, what, did you kind of like try to, figure out exactly what they were playing or did you like what was your practice routine like when you first started getting into it because I know you said you were practicing like day and night what type of practice routine did you have my I didn't really have I didn't have no one to show me what to do so mm -hmm. I pretty much just learned learn as I went and uh just basically I didn't I didn't really learn I've been playing for 25 years I didn't really learn the correct fingering on the base to like probably like the past 11, 12, you know? Oh, wow. So okay. when I, yeah, so when I when I started playing, all I wanted to do was just, I just, I pick a song, I started playing shout music, you know, trying to learn that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and as, and as you know, time progressed, you know, I learned to play songs. I would uh, just learn different approach. I would listen to uh, different, um, different, I listened to other type of music. That's when I started to, kind of uh you know I grew up on Thomas Whitfield, Rudolph Stanfield, Hawkins, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, I always had that strong uh found you know, church foundation, you know, congregational songs and everything. I had that strong foundation. Then I started to branch out into Miles Davis and Coltrane. And, oh, okay, okay. And George Duke, yeah, and stuff like that. And I would just I would just try to emulate what I heard. I would just try to, you know, just, you know, and, it, and sometimes it wasn't until years later, I was like, oh, I was playing that wrong. And I, I could hear 
Mm-hmm. Not in not, my not in my ears got Develop. you know yeah. more mature and bigger. Like I could hear certain things. It's like okay, that's what they were doing. Yeah, just dissecting and I mean just putting in hours and days, weeks, months, and years into it. You know, just and and constantly just you know practicing scales and like I I tell I tell <clears throat> young I tell young musicians. If you at home, you ain't got to worry about a job. Uh, you know, you ain't got no kids. You ain't got no wife. Mm-hmm. You should be living on that. Your your parents should have to threaten you to get off of that instrument. Like, cause yeah. you you got all the time in the world now. You got yeah. all the time in the world. Like um, like uh uh Justin Schultz and his and his sister Jamie. The, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The phenomenon. Yep. Yeah. I love I love how they're capitalizing off of their youth. They don't have to worry about yep, work all and, these and you know all that. They all they man, they are burying themselves in music, and I love oh, yeah. that. Like, yep. and I tell I tell young guys like, man, you ain't got a lot of time. I, yeah. I know, yep. I know. It looks like I was I was saying the same thing. I, I just turned forty last year. Like, okay, you don't have a lot of time. It's no, not I, that time. time yeah. yeah, you eighteen now. You gonna look up and you are gonna be thirty five. You are gonna be like, golly, you know. Yep. So I just encourage, I'd be like, man, when, when I was, when I fell in love with it at 15, man, I was doing my, I was doing my homework at school so I could come home and just practice all night. Oh, and like, wow. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a car. So Saturday morning, I would get up, practice. My mom would call me down, come eat. I'd come down and eat, go right back up, practice, call me, just make dinner. She I'd tell me to come down. I'd come down, eat, go right back. I mean, I like, I surrounded myself in it, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, yeah, to the point where I wasn't even playing my video game anymore. So yeah, yeah, my dad was like, "Whoa, what is going on?" Like when that happens, so. mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So for those of you yeah, watching, so. as you can clearly see, this this greatness didn't happen overnight. He literally put in the oh, work, man. took the time, studied, and familiarized himself with the instrument to the point where he's able to do what it is that he does. So Snoop, you have a kind of unique way of playing. Like most bass players kind of play with the neck down here. Yours is a little tilted. I was going to ask you if that came from playing the upright, but I don't think you played the upright, did you? No, I um, I played violin in fifth grade. I played violin. Yeah, I couldn't read a lick of music. Just I just played what I heard, you know. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't paying attention. I would just, I would hear it and play it back, but I don't know, like uh, when I play playing, when when you sit, it's a certain way called a traditional way that the the bass goes in between your legs, and it's just with the with the way it's the neck is positioned, it just gives you more of a reach, you know, yeah, that way. Okay, I can see as, that. A, as opposed to as a yeah, as opposed to playing it straight, you can't really you know yeah. can't really get it. But whenever I whenever I have it up like this. I'm actually like I used to I used to be more comfortable playing sitting down. Now like now I'm more comfortable playing standing up because it's the natural position of it. Mm-hmm. And I just I got more of a reach. Yeah. That it's just sense. more of a reach advantage. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you are from Detroit, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So that's a obviously yes, a historic city. Like so I don't even want to start naming them, but so many gospel artists that come out of Detroit. Man, man, what was man. it like coming up in a city like that with just talent, greatness, legends all around? What was it like? Man, it's it was so man, I thank God for for just for coming up in that in that time, you know, where before YouTube, before before YouTube, before internet, before all that, you know. And I just, I was able, I was able to have the best of both worlds. I was, um, I came up in a time where you didn't, you didn't have access to, to everybody right. like we do now. We right. can't just sit down and just type something and just be right in front of the person. Like you had to, like, you had to hope the person was in town and, mm-hmm. you know, and then go to see him. And it's like, yo, the, the, like that's your hero, right? I never forget, like, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't even know how. I didn't even know how uh, Dana Davis or Joel Smith looked. Oh yeah. Never yeah. like they could have walked past me be. because I. Yeah, it was no internet. Was no yeah. you know, they didn't have no pictures on the on the uh, 
on the uh you know the cd or album and yeah. so they didn't really do videos like that so my heroes i never knew i never knew what my heroes looked like and it was one time i was at uh did you have was doing a recording uh new hymns or something like back in like 97 okay. 96 yeah and and like me and my brother, we was in the uh, in the audience, and we was watching like all our heroes up there, Myron Bell and Bam, and and it's so it was just so many artists. Like we were just looking like whoa, and 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 uh, my brother tapped me he's like yo, he said yo, that go Dana Davis right there. Dana was leaning up against the wall, and just cool. I was like yo, that's my hero right there. Like I, mm-hmm. I never, I never knew what he looked like. Like my hero standing right there. So, but yeah, man, it's just having, having that type of, uh, having that type of, uh, respect and, and, and love for, for music and for the people that, 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 um, you know, your heroes that you want to want to be like. And yeah. so in doing that and doing that, I had a chance to sit under uh, Rudolph Stanfield. I had a chance to learn from one of the greatest man. I, um, Rudolph Stanfield. Um, so it was a youth choir named Power Praise, and Bridget Stanfield was over that. Okay. And and you had and you know it was uh, just a bunch of young singers. Uh, uh, Tasha Page Lockhart sung in oh, that wow. choir. Uh, Elijah Connor, um, you got people like, uh, it was so many, it, it was just so many, it was just young people, you know, we just young people that could sing. And I had a chance, I had a chance to, uh, uh, Clifton Ross, he's another one, he sung. And, oh, okay. and like, I had a chance to sit under some of my heroes, like, and I, and I got, I, I learned from people like us, uh, it's, it's a organ, like, I love organ, organ is my, like, I wish I could play organ. I just, I wish I had the time to, you know, yeah. but uh, I had a chance to sit under people like Rudolph Stanfield. I had a chance to sit under uh, one of my heroes named Eddie Moore from, from Detroit, okay. uh, Damian Brown, like yeah. just young, Kenny Brooks, Byron Stanfield. Like these are just, these are young guys. I mean, Damian and Eddie, they're a little older than me, but like I got a chance to sit under them and learn, learn the Detroit sound. It's because mm. De- Detroit got a, a, a got, when it comes to gospel, Detroit got a sound that's like that's not like any other. Yeah. And man, I had a chance to sit under them and and learn from and learn from like the greatest. And man, I just I thank God for that, man. I I won't change. I wouldn't change anything. You know? Yeah, and that so, that's amazing to be able to come up like in that era with so many people coming up around the same time. Like you said, you was at a Dietrich Haddon concert. Like right when he was just, yeah. just starting out and stuff. That that's amazing. Man. And we we was looking, yeah, we was watching him. He was that's back when he lived in Detroit and like him and his brother Gerald, they all was just up there and it was just like we was just blown away. We was at perfecting. And mm-hmm. I was like, man, I want to be up there so bad, man. I just wow. I was like I was sitting like, God, I want to be up there and just to watch uh like Dre, he's another bass player, and he passed, he passed years ago. Mm-hmm. And man, just just to watch those guys, it was it was amazing. Yeah, I can imagine. So was it was it the type of culture like it is in other cities where, like, coming up to get your kind of cut your teeth, you would play for like the local choirs or the local groups? Is that kind of how you you got started? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. It, and it was to the point where I I just wanted to play, man. I had to really. People would ask me, "Yo, we doing something? Do you want it?" Yeah. I would just say yes. I didn't. I didn't really ask about money. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't. I wouldn't ask. I was at home. Like I mean, if I got paid, that'd be great. But, but like, I just wanted to play. I wanted to get out there. I wanted to learn. I wanted to play with my heroes. You know, I wanted to be able to be seen with them. You know, I was. You know, wanted. You know, I mean, and plus, you know, you young. You want to play, get the girls. You know, you yeah, wanna, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> want the girls to see you hitting with you. You know. And all that, but that was that was a that was a driving force. But like, but as I as I grew and, and matured in music, like I I found like it's man, it's so many it's so many things you can do, so many places you can go, just in and and just in, with the creativity of it. And and like I would just I started so I started out with uh 
I started out at my church, uh, Open Door Church of God in Christ, you know, playing there, uh, learning, learning the craft. And then I, I started playing for uh, Rudolph Stanfield, uh, Bridget Stanfield, You Choir Power Praise. Then I started playing for Rudolph Stanfield and New Revelation. And from there, I went to, yeah, I went to uh, um, uh, First Lady uh, Sheard, started okay. playing for her. Okay. Then no, I started playing for Kiki first. Then I then oh. I started playing for uh, First Lady Sheard, then the Clark sisters, then Fred. Then it just it kind of just then I I mean I was playing for uh, Anton Foster and Chemistry. There's another group from here. Anton played for the Clark sisters back in the eighties, like you know. Okay. And it's I mean and this and it's a ton of other people, ton of other like groups that I groups and uh, singers and. Uh, that I played for, like, that I can't, like, that I honestly can't remember because there's so many. Like, I would get plays, I would do plays, concerts, uh, just sheds and stuff like that. I will just, I was always playing all the time. Like, sometimes I get paid, sometimes I wouldn't. I just wanted to play. Like, I just, I wanted to play that bad, you know, and just get out there. Wow, that's incredible. Yes, so sir. you you did mention one of the, one of the artists I wanted to talk about. It's actually my all time favorite artist, Fred Hammond. So I believe yeah. it was around like two thousand six, was it or five that you started playing for him? I believe so. Yeah, okay. yeah, it was around about the time. So being that he's he started off as a bass player, he's he's a really great bass player, and you know he's yeah. I'm sure harder on bass players or wants more from the bass players. How was that experience starting out? Man, that was that was the scariest thing I ever encountered, man. Just, wow. you know, you playing, this is the guy, it's Fred. Like, this is the, you know, I remember watching, uh, you know, Spirit of David, uh, you know, the concert at, at Straight Gate here in, in Michigan. And like, yeah. this is the guy, this is let the praise begin. And, you know, and it, it was, he pushes you, He him and his brother Ray, they would tell me, they would tell me all the time, they said, I would, we would rather, we would rather have to calm you down oh. than to always tell you to, to you know, to, to, to amp it up. Wow. That's, that's what they think. We would rather, we would rather say, okay, all right, you know, we would rather say that than always having to, you know, have you do more, do this, be more aggressive. And they just, they wanted, they always would say, you know, we want teeth. They want like teeth on everything. They want everything to be crushing, hard hitting. I mean, ballads was just this big ballads, you know, just, you know, it was tender moments, but he taught me, he taught me like aggression. He really taught me mm -hmm. aggression. And, wow. but yeah, it's, I mean, that was one of the most, I couldn't, it was times like I, I'd be on stage, like, dude, I'll be looking around like, dude, I cannot believe this. And the, my hero, like the guy, the hero is right there. Like, it's crazy, wow. man. I, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That. You you definitely did some 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 great work with him, like, and I it is, it's funny because like his music is bass centric, like he's a bass player, oh, yeah. but he wants that bass. Like if you listen to especially stuff from the nineties, like like around Pages of Life, all you're hearing really is bass, especially yeah. the studio stuff. Oh yeah, because like, I'm a keys player, so sometimes like now I'm like, wait, I, I'm noticing I'm not hearing the keys that much, but it it still yeah. it still smacks, but. <laughs> Yeah, so oh, yeah, I, 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 I can only imagine being a bass player, like what the expectation was, but he's not just going to pick oh, yeah. just anybody. So it, it said a lot that, you know, you would be up. So what was your first project that you worked on with him? Was it Free to Worship or? Free to Worship, yes. I think that was the, that was the first album. And, um, and I, yeah, that was the first album. He, he did, he did, he played, all the bass on the Free to Worship album. I just played Let the Praise Be. I just played um uh This Is the Day. That's, oh, okay. That was the only song I played. Okay. And and even that was a was a was an honor because he always played bass on every song. You know, what's the use? You know, he it's his song, it's his writing, he know what he want, you know, yeah. why not play it? You know, he yeah. played it. So but when we did the live DVD and this is the day he got on the actual album. Right. I was like, oh my God. Like, I mean, because even, yeah. even when uh Maurice's Gerald, another like Chicago legend, legend he yeah. played for him, he never he never played on any album. He never I played on any album because Fred played, yeah, Fred wow. played the albums. 
he would do all the live stuff, um, all the live videos. I think uh, the, the I think the um, the album um, Father Jesus Spirit. I think that's the one where yeah, yeah, well, uh, uh, more, played. most played bass. Yeah, yeah, but back then, yeah, Fred was the one playing bass, and he he didn't need anyone to really. Terrence, uh, I think Terrence Palmer did. Terrence Palmer played. Okay, yeah. Right on on, the, right. I think the very first album, he played some, and Fred played the majority. But mm -hmm. until like after that, he just did most of the playing. So, but to be able to be on, you know, playing bass on a Fred album was just like, man, it was it was mind blowing. It was yeah. Mind blowing. Yeah, I can imagine. So you you got to play with that legend, but you attend or you're a part of the G. GEI Kojic Church now, which is uh, Bishop mm -hmm. uh, Jeju shared. And of course the Clark sisters like uh, uh, Karen and Dorinda go there. And then of course, Kiera, what is that like being able to play yeah. for the Clark sisters, the legendary Clark sisters? Dude, it's, man, they, man, when I tell you, they so much fun. They are so much fun. They let, they let us, they let us experiment. They let us vibe. They love music. They love to dance. They love to shout. And they're, they're not the typical, you know, I guess starch, you know, that they sit there and don't really get it. No, yeah. They'll get up, they'll dance. And like, they just, they just enjoy, they love good music. They love music. And I mean, they're musicians themselves. Like uh, First Lady Shear can play. Yeah, uh, yeah. Daniels Cole can play, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, and then you got Kiki. She'll just grab it. She'll be singing most of the time. Like if you watch the videos, the the live, she'll be singing in the background a lot, you know. Yeah, she'll and, yep. and let the other leaders lead. Yep. And yep. Then when she come out, it's just like whoa, you know, mm -hmm. just you know. And then you got Jay Drew. Jay Jay is a genius. He just genius. he lets us just do whatever. Like he just he let us do whatever. Just whatever. If it's crazy, you're like, yes, let's do that. Just it, anything that's just pushes the envelope as far as timing and core, just anything, we experiment like crazy. Like it's always, I always look forward to going to rehearsal and and doing uh doing the um pre-recording because we all we have a blast because it's you no, know, it's just fun. And and Bishop Sheard, just like I appreciate him because I don't know a lot of pastors don't like like kind of don't i mean the time is changing now but like back years ago a lot of pastors really didn't like their musicians traveling you know right right but right. with him that's that's what his wife does that's what his daughter and his son does and so he was totally open to me traveling like i was i played there like it'll be times i'll be going on tour for like two months and he will let he will let me come right back in and play like mm -hmm. just I was like God like I really like I really appreciate him for that you know because yeah. he didn't you know a lot of a lot of pastors wouldn't do that but I, I thank God for his for his um willingness to let me work and then come back and he just said just just come back and play and like just you know make the service you know contribute to the service you know be on time and you always have a job I'm like yes sir you know. So yeah, I, I really thank God for the shoes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a blessing, man. Yeah. So it, during like at, I would say towards the beginning of the pandemic, like around April, I believe it was, uh, is when Kier announced her virtual tour. And now of course we know everybody yeah. ended up doing like virtual <laughs> concerts and tours and stuff, but I feel yeah. like she was probably one of the first. And I I, I was able yeah. to catch it. It was so incredible. So what was it like man. like putting that together? And then you guys did the Clark Sisters tour. And this is all around the time when yeah. they released the movie and everything. How was that like uh, setting that up and the arrangements? So crazy. Oh, man. It was so, man, it was so refreshing because, you know, we was we were in quarantine for like two months. Yeah. So, bro, I was ready. I was ready to get out the house. I was like, dude, just let me out. Let me out. Yeah. We rehearsing, 12 hours, fine. I don't care. <laughs> I, I just, just get me out. I want out, you know. Yeah. And you know, it's I mean it was good being in, in the house. Like we were just literally, I would take the kids outside, let them play outside, we come back in. I was getting up at five in the morning practicing, you know, just to practice, you know. Oh wow. But like when I got the call to do the tour, uh I was like, yes, you know, and it actually what happened was she had to she had to postpone it at first. She postponed it at yeah, first. Yeah. 
Yep. And yeah, and moved it back a month because you know uh Bishop Shear was like, mm, you want to be you want to be um want to be safe with the you know it was a large group of everyone you know musicians dancers yeah. singers and everything and you know he lost he lost his mom to that yeah. you know lost his yeah. mom so he was really like yeah i don't want to i want y'all to be sure i want you to he told she told he told uh key like i want you to be you know really careful so i think he actually made her postpone it and she was like yes sir and moved it back and then so we started rehearsing and the rehearsals was crazy The you know, you got the dancers, the, the, uh, uh, the vocals and the, the stage, everything. It was, it was, it was pretty amazing, man. It was, it was a great, great experience. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely, like, I'm just, I'm just honored that it, yeah, that she was one of the, like you said, she was one of the ones to kind of kick it off, you know, yeah, so it yeah, was like definitely. a blessing to be in, like be involved with that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you've had a lot of great experiences. I'm sure you've traveled like all around the world and stuff. What was there ever a moment that you can recall with that would be like your biggest wow moment? Like you're like, wow, I can't believe. Well, I mean, I know you talked about Fred playing for Fred, but is there yeah. any particular event or recording or anything that you could think of that was just like mind blowing? Like, I can't believe this happened. I had a, I had a, like a number of those. I uh, My first I think I gotta say it was when I did. I did. Uh, I was blessed to do Ryan Winer's last recording. Oh wow! Okay. And yeah, I never like I had never seen that many people before in my life in one place. Just you know, it, you know. So I, I did that. That was a that was a moment like I was just. I still get nervous every time I play. You know, I'm I'm always nervous and mm -hmm. kind of just a little on edge. But that was a moment. The time I went to man, the time I went to south africa with uh with fred I, we did uh we did do it johannesburg uh Soweto town and that that whole experience was was mind-blowing like just to see how people live in you know that, that just they're living uh how they live just the uh the environment the streets the the poverty and then just to see them come to church and worship the way they do is it was an absolute just, I mean, it was mind blowing. And then another thing with Fred was, um, we always do something called uh, the experience in Lagos, Nigeria. Okay. And the first time I went there, it was, I think the, the capacity, it'd be like, it'd be like, uh, man, like 700,000 people there. It'll be, it'll be a, a cricket stadium where the actual event is held. And then there's another stadium it's an overflow stadium, but just it's just filled with people, just overflow, you know. Wow. And it, it'll be one year is a million, just a million people. Wow. And the, the concert is from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And it's like, wow. it's like, I mean, 20 artists, and like the whole time they up dancing the the two the whole time. Like they wow. from morning to night, and they they up, they there. Like that's another amazing event. Uh, and just and just little, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of moments. Like I'm just, I mean, thank I thank God for the stage. I I love the stage. Just the stage is amazing, but it's the preparation you do at home right. before you get to the stage that gets you ready. And and like I thank God in this in this um in this time where the stage is kind of shut down, you know. Mm -hmm. You really got to have a love for what you do because Absolutely. the stage ain't there no more. You know, right. you, you know, you the show's been shut down and you really got to love what you do in order to number one, stay relevant, keep your sound, keep your, stay up on your, on your, you know, you can only be you can't be nobody else, but just to practice your craft, just to learn and, and, and grow. And yeah, man, just one of my one of my uh, other greatest memories was I played for a, a band called um, Nomadic, and we did we had went to and we went to I think it was Lincoln, Missouri. Okay, you know we don't know nobody there. We we in the sticks, we in the woods, you know, and we playing for people we never seen. You know, you know, you go to New York. New York, Atlanta, you know somebody yeah. that knows somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. You get you can go somewhere and you know, go to out go out to eat and stuff. Man, we were in the country and man, we had a we played at this this um this little theater, 
you know, no, no big stage, no, no top of the line, back line, no lights, no fog, none of that stuff, man. It was just, it was just the music and just imagination. And like, that was one of the greatest, that was one of the greatest musical um, experiences I've had. And this little stuff like that, where it's not just the big stage, it's, right, it's right. Yeah. you know, it's, you can, you can make magic wherever you are. If, if you got the love for it, you got the, you know, just the passion for it. You can make it, you can make it what you want anywhere and you can make it a memorable event. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's incredible. So one of the um, recent projects that you, you were a part of was uh, the Thomas Whitfield or the Whitfield Company reunion. So I know that yeah. coming from Detroit, that had to be huge. And it, it came out so great. Like I was a, I was watching some like Mike Burrell's live while it was happening. And I listened to the album. All yeah. the time. Now, what was that experience? Man. Dude, it took everything in me not to cry in rehearsal. Like wow. that's the Whitfield company is the it's soundtrack to my childhood, man. Wow. It's the soundtrack to my childhood, to my, to my adolescent years. Like, that's all my dad played. My mom and dad played. Like we got Hawkins, we got Whit, uh, you know, uh, Stanfield, but Whitfield was the was the sound, man. And just to hear, just to hear those same voices, like I was fanning out. Like I couldn't, like I would be, I'd be missing stuff in rehearsal just because, like I'm just like, dude, I can't believe this is happening. Like the, this is the Whitfield Company. This is the legendary Whitfield Company. And that's that's another like, I mean, I want a Grammy. Like that's that's the same. Like that's the same thing as winning a Grammy. Like I got a chance to play for the Whitfield Company, and mm -hmm. my my um my good brother um Derek Starks. I just man, I thank God for him giving me a chance. He was another guy I played for growing up. Derek Starks okay. you know, when I was younger. Okay. Derek Starks in the Days Generation. Like I was, I played for him. Just yeah, just trying to just trying to get out there. But man, that was that was an absolute honor, man. It was. I, I I'm still imagine. on cloud nine from that. Yeah, I can imagine. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, all these experiences that you've had in your career, all these opportunities that you had, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, don't remain humble through it all. You know, they kind of start to get a little puffed up because of all their experiences. I haven't met you personally, but from afar, it's so obvious how humble you are. And it, it's wow, like, you'll talk man. to anybody you, you, and then the thing is like, you'll talk to anybody and you act like you've known them for like a long time. Yeah. What, 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 what do you think that, like, what do you attest that to? Like the fact that you're, you remain so humble and approachable all the time. It's arrogance. Arrogance is really ignorance. I mean, just to, to be yeah. honest, arrogance is really ignorance. You, I mean, it's, it's so many, it's man, it's so many so many amazing musicians out there and that the fact that god will number one give you a gift you can't you can't be arrogant with a gift, a this, gift. god yeah. gave it to you you can't yeah. be arrogant with a gift number one he gave it to you number two he puts you in a place where you can with the opportunity could happen you know everything everything that happens is a gift you can't you know you can't you can't look at that and say i did that it's it's like i remember i remember being in my room practicing and feeling like i wasn't growing i remember praying like god i really want to grow like i really want to get better i want to learn it's, it's things i hear that i want to be able to to play and and like and be able to work with and work people i want to work with and you couldn't man you couldn't and like, you know, you hear people say false humility, you know, and stuff like that. And I, I've, I've heard that too. And I was like, hey, I mean, that's yeah. what you feel. But don't none of them, none of them were there when I was in my room praying. Like, God, I, I just want to get better. I want to be able to play. I want to be able to play, you know, and contribute to service. Like, I'm, I never forget. It was the time we were at my church, open door, and it was a, it was like a really. I mean, it was a Holy Ghost filled service. Like, I mean, it was just everybody was dancing, everybody was going forth. And my brother was playing drums, my dad plays organ, my mom sang, my sister sang. The church was just going. And I remember sitting there trying to play. I couldn't keep up. And I couldn't keep up. So it felt like I couldn't 
contribute to the service. And I remember how that felt. Wow. That felt horrible. Like mm-hmm. watching, watching everybody dance and everybody's going and, you know, and, you know, the anointing is falling, just everything. And like, and I'm there and I'm there struggling. Like, and just, I remember praying in my room. I remember, you know, just, I remember when I couldn't play. I remember when, how my, how my, my parents and open door church put up with me when I couldn't play, you know, when mm-hmm. I couldn't, when I couldn't play a lick, they, they let me practice. And to take that opportunity and now God bless you to play. Now you get, now you able to do this for a living. And now you can't talk to nobody now. Now you, right. too, now you puffed up. It's like, yeah. man, come on, man. This, that's, yeah. that's airy. I mean, that's, that's ignorance. Yeah, That's yeah. ignorance. Cause I mean, it's when, when someone, when someone gets so puffed up that they, you know, they, they put this themselves on the pedestal. Number one, I mean, number one, the scripture says, uh, pride go before st- destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. That's what the scriptures say. Right. So it's, it's, that's, it's giving you the blueprint. It's saying, it's, it's predicting the future. If you see somebody that has destruction in their life, uh, you can trace it back to pride. Right. Just, right. just trace it back. It's, I mean, it's, right. it's literally, it's literally giving you the future, you know? Right. And so, yeah. And it's, it's, like pretty much for the, the the short answer is a it's a gift you can't be arrogant with a gift you know yeah. I just just I'm just grateful that God would would bless me to to be able to play because you know it's a blessing yeah absolutely yeah that that's that that sums it up for sure and um just just want to put that out there I really appreciate you uh playing on our, our single from last year all I see is victory that oh, was like man. a dream come true man. I was so hyped when he told me oh, uh, Kevin Powell Told me that Snoop was gonna be playing bass. Oh, you blaze, man. <laughs> them piles, man. Them piles is a problem. Like, yeah, they different. One they different. Just amazing. Yeah, man. I just, I just love, I love getting calls. Like I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay relevant. Like I'm trying. I listen, to, I listen to the young cats. I listen to the older ones. I listen to the ones my age. I listen to the young. Ones. I want to stay. I want to stay relevant. You know, yeah, I want to yeah. stay relevant. You can get. You can kind of get, you know, kind of believe the hype and like, man, you this and you that, and then you stop, you stop learning. You, you know, you don't keep your ear to the ground. You stop playing in services, and so you start to get, you start to get, you know, oh, you start yeah, to get, yeah, you know, just yeah. where you can't keep up, and it's like, yeah. I said, uh-uh, I've been doing this too long, man. Yeah, not doing that. Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, yeah, I, I feel that. So. We we talked about, you know, briefly touched on, you know, the difference in the eras. Like nowadays, younger musicians have access to uh, YouTube and Instagram, Facebook and these things where they can literally sit and study someone all the way across the world or across the country. And it's different yeah. than, you know, how it's coming <clears throat> up for you, how it's coming up for me. Um, a lot of young musicians will want to know, like, how can I find my own sound in that? Um, do you have any advice for that question, how to find the sound and just advice in general, being that you're a husband, a father, uh, and a man of God. So like, what would be your advice to young musicians? Find it, uh, first find your own sound. You, you take, you take a little from here, you take a little from there, you know, and you kind of just, it's a conglomerate of all of what you hear, you know, and you got to, you got to put the time in. That's the thing. You can't be lazy. Like you got to put time in. You got to put work in. You got to. Uh, I know. I've known so many naturally talented musicians that can just play. Like I mean, could just flat out play, but they 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 hit that roof, and then they just they stop there. You know, it's it's no it's no push to keep going. It's no well, I can naturally play anyway, so. There's no studying, there's no, there's no shedding, there's no listening to music. And and it's like, and and it's 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 sad because that potential could be so great, it could go so far, but you know, kind of get lazy, you know, and just and just accept what they that they well, I can already play, but yeah, it's like, yeah, but it's music is always evolving. Music is it's it's I mean, it's it's then then you don't want to get locked into being just a church musician. Sure. You never want to get locked in just to being a church musician. You want to be able 
to you want to be able to play church, but you want to be able to, you know, you need to listen to jazz, listen to R and B, just listen to the approach that they have. Mm. Um, I did a song. Um, I play. I was blessed to play for Jonathan Nelson, like another amazing, amazing singer songwriter, Absolutely. and just and just all around guy. Like that's my guy. And there's a song called "I Believe," and it's, yeah. it's a Caribbean type song. Yep. And but when I heard that song, when when uh, Kenny Sheldon, another a, a phenomenal yeah, uh, producer and, and keyboard player, when I heard that song, I said, I can't approach this song like I'm playing a congregational song. Like you, you can't approach it that way. You gotta, mm-hmm. you gotta study. You gotta. St- I started listening. I mean, I've been listening to reggae, but I would research. I listen to Bob Marley, and I listen to uh, Caribbean, just like Afro Cuban music, and just, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying, just world music, just to see their approach. You know, because it's it's a total different approach. You gotta yeah, have a different way sure. of playing. So you gotta listen to. I tell, I'll tell young musicians, listen to everything, study everything, country, listen to bluegrass, listen to blues, listen to jazz. And you can take little things from, from each of those and, and just and make it your sound. Another thing I had to learn was learn how to take correction. Mm-hmm. Man, learn how to take correction. We live in the time now, the, the information age, these young musicians are so advanced. Like they're, they're so gifted. They're so amazing at, dude, the, the, the young guy from South Africa, Dominique McNabb, the stuff that dude can do on drums. I, I don't even think he's, I don't think he's nine. I think he's nine, yeah, but I, I posted him, man, the stuff that dude can do on drums is unreal. And he's not, He's not even strong yet. He's not even mm-hmm. he's not even 15 yeah. where he can like really just, you know, hit. Yeah. That kid is, I think he's maybe 10. And but they they're so advanced and they're so young. And then you and then they gotta sit in a church where the minister of music is isn't as advanced as they are. Mm-hmm. So it's like they gotta, man, I can play better than this dude, but I gotta listen to him. I gotta do what he says. And it's like that's it's all about the process it's the process of this man or this woman has been playing serving under this ministry they they didn't come up in the youtube era but they but they have experience they have knowledge they have wisdom in what they're doing you you being humble enough to listen just learn to listen learning learning what not to do is just as important as learning what to do. You know what I'm That's saying? True. You're not you're not going to agree with everything you do. You're going to hear me like, yeah, I wouldn't do it that way. But just learn to listen. I mean, you know, give your feedback, give your feedback, you know, be respectful, but learn to have a listening ear. Mm-hmm. Learn to have a listening ear because I, I learned like, you know, reproof never feels good. It never feels like I, I came up under Rudy and Eddie Moore and and Damien, like them guys, they was brutal. They was like a lot of these young guys wouldn't be able to make it back then when I was coming up. They wouldn't be able to make it because you got embarrassed. Like you got embarrassed. And, you know, but that what that did was it made me go home and work hard to make sure that didn't happen again. And because I respected them, because I wanted to be where they are. Like I I wanted to be a musician like them. I wanted to be... You know, I wanted to be where they are. I, you know, I took, it didn't feel good. It was embarrassing. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't good. But one thing I noticed about them was it was never one side. If I did something good, they showed it. They said something about it, like, you know, yeah. they would, they woo, and they would go crazy. But when I messed up, it's like, hey, you know, so it was, so it was equal. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't one side. It wasn't just, you know, they cussing me out and stuff like that. But when I did something good, they, they, they affirmed me. Right. So, but that's the generation we kind of living in now. Nobody wants to hear nothing negative. Nobody right, wants to right. hear no correction. And it's like, you got to learn, you got to learn to listen to correction and, and take it, take correction. It's not going to feel good when you, when you get into correction, but like the scriptures say, in the end, it's going to yield, it's going to yield fruit. You're going to, you're going to see it's like, okay, I see what he was talking about. Now I right. couldn't see when he told me but now I can see. And like, 
just learning to have that, you know, putting putting the the talent that they have aside, the knowledge and, and just being able to sit under someone and learn and and go through the process. And so that way you can be, you know, you can be ready when your time comes. So that's what I say, like, just really learn to have a listening ear, humble yourself, listen and, and study to stay hungry. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's priceless advice. And I, I believe anybody that is watching, if you take heed of that, then you're going to be all right. So we, we're going to wrap this up, man. Thank you again so much for taking this time out of your, your schedule to do this interview. This has blessed me. I'm sure it's going to bless so many other people. Wow. Man, before we go, you got you got a, a quick crash cut uh, impersonation. <laughs> <laughs> you be killing me with those uh, impersonations, man. <laughs> crash cut is my guy, man. I love that guy, man. I gotta say, uh, man, I'm honored. I'm honored that you would consider me, man. I really am. I really am. Uh, let me see. Hold on. Let me see if I can freestyle some. Uh, let me see. Uh, Andrew McClendon in the musician <laughs> with Andrew. Yeah, <laughs> bro, you sound bro, just like that, man. dude. Yeah, bro, I crazy. study like I study that dude, man. He blesses my life, man. I love, I love Crash. Cause. Big shout out to Crash, cause, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, as I always <laughs> say, this has been the interlude with Drew. And I say at the end of every episode, only what you do for Christ will last. Take it one day at a time and keep it pushing. This has been another episode of The Interlude with Drew with my man, Alan Snoop Evans. Thank you again, my brother. I appreciate it. Bro, I'm honored, man. Yes, sir. And those of you watching, we'll catch you next time. Yes, sir. It's The Interlude with Drew. Drew. Welcome to The Interlude with Drew.